sound for wind-powered electric generation facilities pursuant to Section 12A of Act 174, which was passed by the legislature last year. My name is Margaret Cheney, and I'm a member of the Vermont Public Service Board. With me tonight is Staff Attorney John Cotter. To my left. And uh, we're holding other public hearings around the state this week, and so we're spreading our um, presence. I'm lucky to be in Bennington tonight. So the purpose of tonight's hearing is to provide an opportunity for the Public Service Board to hear input from members of the public regarding the rule being developed to regulate sound levels for any future wind power and electric generation facilities in Vermont. Tonight's public hearing will be transcribed by a court reporter, and this transcript, along with all other comments received by the board at public hearings and in writing, will be considered by the board as it moves forward in the rulemaking process. The legislative directive to the board requires that the rule be adopted by July 1st. Tonight is the first in a series of three public hearings that will be held in the evenings at different locations throughout the state this week. Also, an all-day workshop on the technical aspects of the rule will be held in Montpelier this Thursday in the board's hearing room beginning at 9.30 a.m. You can find the text of the draft rule on our website. And final written comments on the rule must be filed by May 11th to allow the board to prepare the necessary documents in support of the rule for filing of the Secretary of State and the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules in time to meet our deadline. Please remember this is not the only forum for your input. If you wish to provide more detailed comments, or if you would prefer not to speak tonight but want to provide written comments at a later date, we encourage you to send written comments either by email or by regular mail. Please include a reference to the rulemaking for sound from wind generation facilities when you submit written comments. If you do have written comments with you this evening, please feel free to hand them in to us tonight. But please keep in mind the May 11th deadline for final written comments. The addresses for submission of written comments are by email psb.clerk at vermont.gov or by regular mail Vermont Public Service Board 112 State Street, Montpelier, Vermont 05620. And we have pieces of paper here on the table if you didn't write that down or have a short memory, uh, pick it up. So we'll get started. We have a sign up sheet. We have um, started on the second one. I'll call your name. I'll also call the name of the next person so that person can be ready to speak. And please, when you start to speak, first state your name for the um, for the transcript for the court reporter here. And if it's a difficult name, please spell it. The first one is pretty straightforward. It's Frank Seawright, followed by Jojo, who will have to spell her name. <laughs> Uh, uh, good evening, my name is Frank Sierra, I'm from the town of Weber, Vermont, and I would like tonight to tell you why I would like for you to maintain the uh, setback as it is proposed in the, uh, uh, as a man. Uh, the reasons are, the proposed setback will, number one, it will end playing games. Uh, we know the turnback will be placed on the highest elevation of the site. A setback allows everyone to know from the outset whether or not the site is appropriate for large band installation. Using readily available things like Google Earth makes it easy. Just locate the turbines on the highest ground, draw a one mile buffer around each one, and everyone can easily see if the site has potential. If it is obvious that the site is inappropriate, time will be saved, anxiety about proximity eliminated, and uh, interference with the only development of the town avoided, and state agencies will not waste resources on a project that can be adjudged unworkable right from the outset. Number two, orderly development. Uh, local realtors have analyzed home sales in our town and surrounding towns. During the years, our town was under threat for other wind insulation. Sale of homes dropped from a predictable average of eight per year to nine. 
The same drop off was not noted in surrounding towns. Our town is projected to be the third largest gainer population in Wyndham County by the year 2030, and the prospect of land installation caused a definite hiccup in the orderly development of our town. The third reason is the effects of uncertainty. We had over four years of uncertainty before the developer presented the preliminary project layout. During that time, rumors were rampant. Shallow presentations built to informational workshops answered none of our questions. The developer and landowner deflected questions by saying, we're still doing studies, or it's too early to say anything. Keeping us guessing, I eventually divided the town into two groups, those supporting and those condemning the project. Once those two groups were established, the wind developer exploited it to its fullest. The mistrust, incivility, and finally hostility developed to a near unendurable limit and freed the developer and landowner from discussing the merits of the installation. Uh, the end fighting between the two groups redirected the debate away from the details of the project and allowed the developer to stand aside and view the dog fight while steadily moving ahead with the project. That venomous trio of mistrust, incivility, and hostility remains in our town today, even though the project was canceled, canceled following a decisive vote against it. None of that was necessary. A known setback would have shown what was feasible for our town at the very beginning, and we could have remained the ideal for our town that is a worldwide vision. That concludes my comments. Thank you very much.
in the 15 years that I've had an operation, none of my neighbors have ever complained. None, none of my neighbors have heard it. But I point out to you right now that the air conditioning in this room would violate their standards. So I will hope that when you're drafting these standards, you realize that small wind, especially this net meter small wind, 30 kilowatts or less. You're not talking about developer wind, you're talking about individuals who are trying to generate more power and give some back to the community. That they not be burdened with the same standards that you're drafting for large commercial wind farms. Specifically, they need to test annually. That would, that would mean that no wind that meter is burdened and wind turbines in there. They just keep them off grid. You wouldn't stop the wind turbine being put in. It would just negate the benefit to the greater society. So please, if you're drafting your standards, keep in mind that small wind is a completely different animal than large wind.
There's also a second irony, and that certainly it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tangential link to the actual wind power itself and the need for it. But Flight 93 crashed in Somerset County, Pennsylvania at 9-11. Certainly, our pursuit of fossil fuels, I believe, may have some linkage to that event. I've seen windmills in Netherlands, and I've seen them in Denmark. I've also seen them in West Texas, where admittedly they do no harm. As to the aesthetics, to me, large-scale windmills are a visible symbol of a community and a state that is taking responsibility for its own energy consumption. Given the controversy surrounding the sound, having no major large-scale wind develop seems a very high price to pay for a marginal scientific argument on any disproportionate uh, effect from the sound and the disproportionate effect it will have on wind power in this state. And, it has been, and as has been mentioned, these restrictions will make it extremely difficult to meet the state's renewable energy goals. Thank you. Efficiency gains drops over time, so I assign that 
The other thing is, the argument is renewables aren't based power. There's tons of millions of ideas as to how we can convert renewable energy and store um, energy at a conversion loss of no more than 15%. So that's, that's how we can get there in eight years. Um, my problem with this particular issue is I, I believe this 35 decibel level, the intent of it is to block large-scale commercial wind in Vermont, which is our very best solution. If you do the math of all these other options, it's the most financially economical uh, source of energy per cost per unit of energy. And it's also the least totally environmental impacting of all those other sources, including all fossil fuels and nuclear options. We're looking at this wrong. Large scale commercial wind is our best asset and our smartest decision in terms of the limited amount of money we have to spend in a very, very short time we have to solve this problem. And the PSB, in my opinion, is the source of our society where popularity and politics and opinions and, and uh, organized groups and things all go by the wayside and wise decisions about how my grandchildren are going to fare are on your shoulders.
so the data that is gathered is contaminated and useless. We learned the wind company experts write the operating protocols to enable them to discard all the data that would find a violation. We learned that wind turbine owners will not turn the turbines off when iced, even when the protocols they wrote require them to do so. We learned from neighbors that 45 dBA is way too loud, and we can't believe how loud 40 dBA is. We learned that wind projects are being built in some of the quietest places in Vermont with very low background noise levels, 20 dBA or lower. We learned that noise control experts know that an increase of 10 dBA above background will result in complaints. We have learned what doesn't work. It doesn't work to trust wind companies' experts and experts hired by government agencies directed by a governor who tells them to do nothing to stand in the way of wind energy. It does not work to allow wind company experts to do pre- and post-construction monitoring, write the protocols, or be responsible for compliance. We learned that 35 dBA is the right standard for Vermont at the property line for all taxpaying properties regardless of length of occupancy, and that the only solution for infrasound is distance or smaller turbines. We have learned that the only way to assure compliance is with independent, continuous, full-spectrum sound monitoring that includes audible noise, low-frequency noise, and infrasound for the life of the project. Thank you.
support municipal, cooperative, and community ownership models. No renewable energy source should be off the table for a community to evaluate. Participation and in energy investment should happen across income levels and property ownership status, as this power belongs to all of us. Keep the benefits of generating renewable energy local, including renewable energy credits, and guarantee that no family has to spend more than 5% of their income to pay for energy. We need to spend more time focusing on energy democracy that will bring power, political and economic, to all Vermonters, rather than on ways that restrict our energy options and leave power in the hands of a few corporations and out-of-state developers. The only people who benefit from more stringent rules, from caps on net metering to restrictive policies on siting, sound, or other technology-focused concerns, are the corporations who take millions of dollars from our communities and who answer to only a few. Energy democracy begins to undo the decades of regulations and rules that profited only a very few, while often limiting what individuals and communities can do in order to sustainably power their homes and businesses. Energy democracy is a big picture vision that includes and benefits all Vermonters, keeps and renews our vital natural resources, and allows us to determine our own futures. Thank you for your consideration. Daniel Michelson, and then a signature I can't quite read, but the first um, name is the initial K. That's me. Okay, great. So when you come up, please. Can I pass? Okay, you'll pass. Then the next one is Mary, and then the last name is Michael Okay. My name is Daniel Michelson. I'm from Grafton, Vermont. Uh, I have a question and a comment. But the question is, who will be administering any of the decibel tests? And is the, the body administering the test, is it neutral, or is it the wind company, or somebody, a, a group that has something at stake um, uh, in, in doing the testing? And the comment is that the decibel limit now that you uh, currently proposed at 35 decibels, um, should not be an average decibel over a period of an hour, but a maximum. Because my understanding is in the past, uh, that when the wind company did the testing, in order to hold to the average of whatever was the, the decibel uh, limit, um, at their discretion, the turbines uh, would be turned off for a period of time in order to reach the average of 35, uh, or average of whatever it was at that, at, uh, at, under the law. Um, the, the simplistic way of looking at it would be, you know, being stopped by somebody for speeding, an officer for speeding, and saying, well, I was mostly doing 40 during the hour, and I just happened to be doing 80 for just a few minutes. Um, in terms of decibels, when it goes uh, high and then it's averaged out to whatever the, the, the legal thing is, that high period is is um, not um, can be uh, maybe unbearable for that time. But officially, you can come in uh, under at, at whatever the the average is supposed to be. So I would suggest that it be considered as a maximum as opposed to the average. Thank you. I'm Mary Buckle from North Bend, and I've seen three. I'm not just say to the, the next person up to be. Um, is that same? Austin or Dustin? Looks like a Dustin. Okay, do you know who you are? Okay, great. Sorry to interrupt. I'm Mary Buckle from North Bennington, and I visited out west two years ago, and there was tons and tons of windmills, and we never heard anything. They were beautiful, in fact. And what I really noticed was there was no power lines. You know, your power lines, even if you walk along the power lines, you can hear that high hum. And I was wondering if they ever tested what that level would be. And the other thing, uh, we visited Denmark about 20 years ago, and they power by windmills, 
and it was really unbelievable. You couldn't hear anything. So I really wish that, you know, or hope that you uh, consider, you know, that they are pretty quiet. And also, I really think people that lived in the state of Vermont back when they had them up on Mount Equinox, they were very bad. They were very loud. They were everything wrong with what happened up there, but they're not there anymore. But if you remember that, maybe everybody has that taste in their mouth that that's why they don't want the windmill today when, you know, it really is quiet in my estimation. And I just want you to know I am for it. And I was here, I came tonight because I was looking at solar energy and I wanted to see what the windmills had to offer. Thank you.
In particular, the American National Sound Standards, Section 12.9, Part 3, Standards and Standards. For outdoor measurements in Section 12.100, for background noise studies in quiet rural areas. So in actuality, the background sound of L90 on Fairfield Pond was, as well as other sampling sites at the Swamp Wind Project, would be even lower, making the increase in DBA levels from the wind turbines even more extreme. The World Health Organization has noted that a child's autonomic nervous system is 10 to 15 decibels more sensitive to noise than adults. At the proposed Swamp Wind 7 499-foot industrial wind turbine project, there are 10 children living within 2,000 feet, the closest of any existing project in Vermont, and the tallest proposed turbines in Vermont. The increase in DBA noise created by the industrial wind turbines represents a huge increase in audible sound. Increases of 10 DBA at night are long known by acoustic consultants to raise complaints. And increases of 15 to 20 decibels are associated with widespread complaints and legal action, such as what's going on in Ireland. Averaging measured levels of sound across two wide frequency bands also allows a height of sound pressure level peaks to which the ear responds, understating the true extent of facilities and noise emissions. solar are really our options. 
if we are ever to face a situation where we have to go it on our own. To establish, I'm, I'm part of 350.org, um, and you know we're very concerned about the climate and also about the current, uh, you know, political situation, which is basically dismantling every effort to control this situation. Vermont has consistently been a leader in this effort, uh, standing up where, where many others have not. I would hate to see us lose that because we want to be over-restricted. This is not PFOA. This is the wind sound. So I think you've got to research it. Vermont's very good at researching everything very, very carefully. We've been very impressed with the way they've handled the PFOA. I hope they handle this wind situation as astutely and prudently as they handle the PFOA situation. Um, I think we have to be aware that we will probably have a carbon tax coming down the road here before too long, if not in the state on a federal level. Wind is going to be extremely competitive in those circumstances. To basically put ourselves out of running initially unnecessarily is foolish, I think. I think we should not be putting standards which are that different from the state's standards. It's not PFOA. We're not setting that kind of a standard, I don't think. I think we basically want to be competitive. Where we lived in western Pennsylvania, we had a wind Mill blade factory that employed many, many people. It's run by a Spanish company. It's extremely well managed, extremely well paid. Wind provides lots of employment. We are losing people from, from Vermont on a regular basis, young people. This would provide a lot of jobs for young people and it would bring other young people into the state, I believe. Just like solar also provides lots of jobs. Unlike many of the fossil fuel industries, when you can take the mills down when something better comes along pretty easily. You can't do that with any fossil fuels. You know, the damage is permanent, it's going to last for thousands of years, but you can correct anything with wind in a very short period of time. So, with uh, some of those thoughts, I guess, you know, I, just, I would really encourage us to be on a pastor too, in prayer about this. Fellow Vermonters, our world is in trouble, and you have the power 
to set moderate sound standards for wind generation and keep us moving forward in earth-saving ways. Well, somewhere, some leaders are trying to bake us alive with increased demands of energy from fossil fuels. You can give the earth a breath of cool air with moderate sound standards and also encourage power supplies that we need. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sue Andrews. I reside in Shaftesbury, Vermont. And I'm going to start by saying, you know, if we're trying to reduce our energy use, why are we running this noisy machine? It's six, I just checked my phone, it's 62 degrees outside and we have operable windows. Why are we burning whatever we're burning to make it cool in here? So as several previous speakers have noted, um, we need to look at the big energy picture, and we need to do it now. When I had my sons 25 and 27 years ago, I didn't know that they weren't going to be able to have a world to live in. It's just amazing how quickly all this is happening. We're building wind farms to stop burning fracked natural gas and other fuels. Because wind can deliver power at times of the year when solar output is low, it can allow us to succeed. So if wind power can be the success to saving our climate, or the key to saving our climate, then does it make sense to eliminate it on the basis of sound, even when we are surrounded by so many things that are far louder? <coughs> that list includes driving our cars, cars passing near our homes, televisions, radios, earbuds, lawnmowers, dogs, geese, crows, even chickadees. My husband and I sat on our deck this weekend and listened to all these and thought about the levels that we were hearing. The kid next door who played basketball for four hours on Saturday, that's noise when you hear a ball dribbling for that many hours. We have to be sensible. We don't have time to waste. The climate is too important. In the past, millions of Americans have willingly sacrificed their lives for the next generation. My father-in-law, recently deceased, lost part of his hearing as he fed ammunition into a machine gun during World War II so that we could be where we are today. No one's hearing will ever be harmed in a thousand years by the sound of a wind farm a mile away. I hope we haven't lost the courage and the strength to do what needs to be done. Thank you. Next is Ellen Maloney, followed by Ben Freeman. And I've noticed some more people come into the room. If you would like to speak, we have a clipboard up here. Uh, put your name on and we will get to you shortly. <coughs> In light of what everyone else has been saying about the vital importance of taking control of our environment and avoiding cooking ourselves if, to the extent that we still can, uh, I would like to point out to, that the Public Service Board is an incredibly, in a, in an incredibly uh, special position. Uh, you are people of great honor who we have trust uh, to to make decisions involving the public good, but balanced against community or with, with community concerns. Uh, that's been enhanced a lot now by F-174, which really uh, will, uh, I think, greatly inform the whole process. It seems to me to be self-defeating uh, to place our, our, our trust in you, and at the same time, to allow the the 35 decibel uh, proposed rule to limit the consideration of projects that might have great merit. In other words, I think you short, you will end up shortchanging your own jurisdiction. When you're informed by the community input as well as knowing the public good, uh, you should have every opportunity to exercise your discretion and to uh, to, to enhance the, the public good without uh, cutting off 
before the starting line uh, several of these projects. I think that that's important. Thank you. Thank you, Ben Freeman, and then Tim Ben. Mark. Mark, sorry. My name is Ben Freeman. I'm from Peru, Rwanda. I'm coming here today as a parent and an educator, and speaking as one of the younger people in the room, advocating for more options for renewables in Vermont rather than fewer. Um, we have set very ambitious goals in Vermont to meet high levels of renewable energy standards by 2050. Um, quite frankly, those standards are not nearly ambitious enough to meet the needs of present and future generations. If we could feel the damage that's being inflicted upon millions of people around the world by our fossil fuel choices, we would never permit those choices to be made. We have an opportunity and responsibility in Vermont to put our money where our mouths are, to be a Green Mountain State, to be more ambitious and conservative, and to choose a brighter future for my children, and the children and grandchildren of others in Vermont. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Tim Marr from Bennington. Um, I think we can all agree that that's too loud. Um, I think uh, this guy right here said 65 decibels. So that's pretty loud. Yeah, that's up there. Um, when I got an email talking about this hearing, I couldn't believe that what was happening was to try to set a decibel standard that would actually eliminate commercial wind projects in a state that's trying to achieve um, renewable energy goals by 2050, which I think should be 2025, according to this person here, gave a great testimony. Um, so I, I just don't think we can do that. Um, what are the other states doing like, that are really serious about this? California, Oregon, Washington, Minnesota. Um, I would just ask them and adopt the standards that they have. And, um, don't be uh, ridiculous and have a 35 decimal. Um, a few years ago, I skied on the Catamount Trail, which goes extremely close to the Lowell Wind Project, and it was a the day it was there was a bit of wind, and the wind turbines were picking up that wind. I couldn't believe how you know they were spinning around, and I got closer than anybody's permitted to go. Uh, the house, the nearest house, was quite far away, um, which was complaining I guess, about the sound, but. I really couldn't hear them and the other people around me. And when I went over to the town of Lowell and stayed in the bed and breakfast, the people I talked to said um, they were they were fine with, with the wind. I, I understand you're going up to Lowell, so I would urge you to adopt reasonable standards for uh, sound on winters, not to restrict them. Thank you. Thank you, Dick Dundas and George Harvey. In my view, the board should not 
cave to the biases of the few who are annoyed. The board should be concerned about the bigger picture and the effect of global warming on our civilization. So therefore, I would implore you to be less restrictive. There's a lot of misinformation going around on wind turbines, 
there's a lot of information that is not easily available about fossil fuels. The fossil fuels industry, I went to Wikipedia in 2015 and looked at the, at the list of the largest companies in the, in the world by revenue. The entire wind turbine industry wouldn't make it to that list because its revenues were only about $90 billion. The cutoff was $100 billion to be on the list. 63 companies. Coke Industries was on it. 21 of those companies were oil and gas. They don't want wind power. They don't want utility scale solar. They want to sell their fossil fuels, which are killing another person every 10 seconds. Now, today, those Coke Industries is no longer on the list. And of the, of the 21 um, uh, oil and gas companies, only seven are there. There's only seven remaining, and they, each one of those has lost more than 30% of its revenues in the last uh, year. These people are scared. And what are they funding? Well, they're funding a bunch of things, including one organization putting $895 million into making sure that their people were elected to the Congress of the United States. They have engineered a, a, a takeover that has so far been successful of the government of the United States. All of this stuff is available. All you've got to do is go and look for it. I, I think that it's sad that the people in Vermont are being duped by this kind of activity. Thank you very much.
we need to be excited about this kind of stuff and actually talk about solutions and not just ways of stopping our progress in being happy in being able to turn on this light every time we walk into a room. Anyway, thank you very much. Well, what I'm going to say is kind of subjective, um, not so much numbers. But I, I grew up in uh, what's now Silicon Valley, um, Los Angeles, and um, one of the things I remember really clearly was we drove we drove to San Francisco for other people. There. And um, this air was brown on many, many days. Um, since then, a lot has changed. Things can change. Things can change for the better. And uh, the air is not brown anymore. There's actually very more cars. There's a problem with noise pollution. It's from cars. Um, but, and that's kind of everywhere. Um, we have, I live in Stamford, Vermont. Um, we, the neighboring state owns the ridge right above Stamford, uh, Massachusetts, and they put up the windmills. And uh, they're pretty good ones. And, uh, at first, a lot of people in town really hated them, and um, there was, you know, I think really the, a lot of the reaction has to do with this idea that we live in, in a kind of a pristine kind of wilderness place. We don't. We live, all of us, pretty much on part of this massive grid built by fossil fuels. We drive all the time. Most of our houses are heated by it. We have to change. It's burning up the planet. Wind is a big part of the solution. Nobody talks about in Stanford hearing windmills. I mean, it really was a strain to hear them ever on a clear, on a like kind of a low wind day. If it was loud, a windy day, you couldn't hear it because the wind would make so much noise in the trees. But just on the, just if circumstances were just right and we were in a clear spot and the line was just right, you could barely hear them. It's, it's silly. There's constant noise from the traffic. I'm very sensitive to noise. I actually uh, chose my house because it was far enough away from the highway that I didn't have to hear highway noise. Um, but I think driving over here, you know, everybody along the way, there must have been 100, 150 houses, heard more noise than windmills. Um, we need to think differently. We need to think about the future. We need to think about this planet. And become caretakers and protectors of it. Thank you. My name is John Snow, and I live in a house that is totally operated by wind and solar, absolutely off the grid completely. I work around the window a lot. I have a sawmill up there, and I have yet to see a dead bird. In fact, I have seen deer eating grass underneath the window with them going. And when you live in West Dover, one of the things that you hear pretty often all went along is snow guns. And you tell me, do the windows make more noise than the snow guns for going so long and all? That's about all I got to say. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now, my name is uh, Jason Day, and uh, my company is uh, Starlet Turbines. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you know, a little story uh, about our company. Uh, we moved up here from uh, New Jersey uh, to uh, uh, the build factory. And uh, what we do is we make small wind turbines. We make uh, medium-sized wind turbines. Uh, these turbines are, are typically for, uh, for individual ownership, um, for a farmer or <coughs> a Vermont landowner, and um, uh, to, uh, to make their own, their own energy. And they, they range in size anywhere from uh, uh, powering one house uh, up to uh, 20 or 30. And, and uh, <coughs> uh, this is a huge market. Uh, Worldwide, um, and we're just we're just getting started uh, throughout the world. Uh, the uh, the Chinese and the Europeans have been um, ahead of us by 20 years, um, and um, it's we're still getting started. The USA is going to be the largest uh, market in the world right now. Um, so. And so, <clears throat> it's important um, to learn how to, uh, to make your own energy. Um, and, uh, um, and develop this, uh, this technology um, in Vermont. Um, so, um, uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, the sound, the new sound ordinance. Um, the thing, that, the point that I want to make is that we're talking about uh, uh, the numbers, um, decibels, and distances, and um, the. Uh, uh, it makes a big difference between you know, even a couple of dB, or uh, three dB is is a, is a double of sound pressure. Um, so if you if you look at I'll tell a story about a uh, <coughs> small wind turbine that manufactured by uh, Berge Wind Turbines, uh, which is I believe the the most popular wind turbine in Vermont, and it's the most popular wind turbine in <coughs> North America, and it's uh, certified by uh, an organization called SWCC, which is uh, funded by uh, Amrel. And that turbine, um, the previous uh, the previous sound spec or the, the temporary sound spec, the previous um, or the, the present one is uh, 45 decibels for uh, 10 dB over uh, L90, the background noise. So by that by that terms, uh, there's a couple things to consider. Uh, Small wind turbines are, are specified um, in DBA, first of all, not DBC. This is how they're measured. And they're, um, they're uh, uh, certified and tested towards uh, a different specification, different than large turbines. Um, and uh, it's not, uh, if you look up uh, the SWCC website, you'll see a list of turbines there. And they're all, um, basically uh, measured in DBA uh, 600 meters or 200 feet away from um, uh, the tower. And uh, <clears throat> now a Berge wind turbine uh, makes about 43 DBA at 200 feet. And this is, um, that specification is supposed to represent the average wind speed of about 11 miles an hour. Um, so that means um, that um, most of the time it's going to make 43 decibels of noise 200 feet from the tower. And as a, a rule of thumb, uh, noise attenuates about uh, 6 decibels, just as a rule of thumb, 
every time you double the distance. So by that measurement, a Berkey wind turbine would be making um, 37 decibels of noise, and then we're talking about average noise um, at 400 feet. And 30 or 35 feet would be a little bit farther, we'll say, five or 600 feet. Not, not a total, it's not totally difficult to do that. But the, uh, the sound specification, when you change it to 35 decibels and you call it a maximum sound, um, then you throw in a huge obstacle. Uh, for example, um, if you were to look at the Berkey sound data, it makes its maximum noise at 26 miles an hour. And that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to 57 dBA. And that's uh, so then you take your Vermont spec and you start adding or doubling the distances uh, from 57, or so we'll just use the number 55, 55 decibels at 200 feet, which is its maximum noise, which happens 26 miles an hour on the average if you, if you look at the what's called the, <coughs> the Weibull curve. Which is the um, which is the average probability instance of probability? Okay, 26 miles an hour happens at less than a half percent of the time, whereas 11 miles, 8 miles an hour happen 20, 30 percent of the time. What this means is that somewhere in the neighborhood of point. 2% is somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 hours a year of 87, 16 hours a year. So it's a very minor period of time. And the 57 decibels, if you use the same um, uh, types of uh, attenuation formula, basically puts 35 decibels somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,300 to 500 feet. So <clears throat> my customers come to me and they ask, how many acres do I need uh, to put up a winter farm? And um, I tell them, okay, is five acres enough? And is, um, is 10 acres enough? And um, <clears throat> this is, we want to power, we want to power our house and maybe we want to do some so group metering, um, and uh, I told them, you know, the Birdie wind turbine or other turbines like it, which basically average about the same power levels. Uh, you need uh, the 1,300 feet, which is, if you, if you calculate what that comes out to, it's 155 acres. If you put a house on every side of a, a square, 100 feet outside the property line, uh, that's how much land you would need to put up a uh, the bird turbine. Um, so I would I would like to illustrate a scenario. Um, if you had a uh, that's something to consider a small wind turbine like the Bergie um, that makes similar noise, uh, it would make. A, <coughs> You know, if you were to go back to the 45 decibels of noise, which is the way the temporary sound spec is now, just use that as a, a point of merit. Um, in fact, I'll even reduce it. We get the numbers at 42 decibels, uh, which, was, which is the daytime limit. Um, so that turbine, we did the numbers, and 42 decibels, that very turbine uh, would be installed at uh, 650 feet. And the noise occasionally would happen uh, 16 hours out of 8760. It's like less than um, uh, less than a couple of a fraction of a couple percent. Um, at that time at night, um, the neighbor, um, because we're talking about uh, uh, making its maximum noise, we're talking about winds above 20 miles an hour, which is a storm. If you were to consider
consider uh, six miles an hour average miles, and that would, that would blow your hat off. If you were to consider 11 to 15 miles an hour, that would, that would blow your, your trash can down the street. 20 to 25 miles an hour, and this, uh, and this turbine is in the same neighborhood, uh, other than large wind turbines. This turbine would be in the same wind environment of the house, so it's um, 650 feet away. Uh, that neighbor has gone inside uh, during the summer time. Uh, most likely, they have closed their windows um, at night. To, to go to bed, and um, the average house, as, as was brought out in many of the workshops previously up in Montpelier, will attenuate sound anywhere in the neighborhood of 6 to 25 uh, dBA, say an average of 12 to 15 decibels. Um, so there, therefore, if you do the math, your net sound inside would be less than, than, the, than the desired uh, 30 decibels. Uh, also, you have to take into account because uh, small wind turbines are not going to be 4,000 feet away, they're going to be 400, 800 feet away. You're in the same wind environment, therefore, the background noise of the house um, is going to be at 20 miles an hour, it's going to be making huge background noise outside in the, in the form of trees, high grass, uh, in the wintertime, even. Evergreens and bare trees will make um, 40, 45 decibels of noise, and in the summertime they'll make uh, 50, 55 decibels of noise, which will mask and, um, and dissipate the sound. Um, so um, that's our conclusion here about uh, small wind turbines. It's, it's going to be a, a great industry uh, for Vermont. Um, we're hoping to hire uh, 50 people, and um, let's see, um, uh, and uh, evolve from there. Um, and uh, hopefully, we can get to the point where um, where it makes sense for the regular people that have you know, in, in the communities to make their own energy. People that have uh, small small properties at 10, 15 acres to be able to have uh, have their own winter life.
in 2008, we had two, 10 years to stop the increase of greenhouse gases um, before the ice caps started to melt and the methane and the permafrost is released and the cycle becomes um, self-sustaining, uh, the cycle of warming. We're at that point. Uh, it went faster than, than that prediction. Um, because the increase, we haven't halted and we haven't um, slowed down, we, we've increased. So we are on the verge of climate disaster. We have to act, we have to act now. I'm not in favor of doing anything that that's harmful to animals or, um, but you know, we have to weigh what's, what is the most important um, for our, all our good and uh, the harm that comes from fossil fuels is immeasurable. Um, we talk, I've heard people talk about the subjectivity of sound and then there's the subjectivity of aesthetics. Um, I agree with Mary who says that they're beautiful. Um, I had the opportunity to drive a few years ago through Sweetwater, Texas. I had no idea what I was about to encounter. Uh, miles and miles and miles of windmills, on and on and on. The, my windows were down in my car. I didn't hear anything uh, as the road goes through this incredible wind farm. I also saw them in North Dakota. Um, so, you know, I, I, to me they are way less offensive than um, power lines and smokestacks. Uh, mountains that are uh, strip mined uh, on, on uh, tar sands, you know, there's, there's no good uh, fossil fuel. And so we have to consider our options and <coughs> solar and wind are what we need to, to be going to when we need to go to them fast. Um, I think it is short sighted and um, selfish for us in Vermont to say, oh, we don't want that here in our backyard. You know, we think it's pretty, or um, it, we, I mean, the whole sound things, I agree with the person who said it was ridiculous. Um, it's okay for the people in West Virginia or uh, Pennsylvania to suffer from the effects of coal mining, but you know, and for us to take the electricity that's generated from that, there, there are too many years of disconnect. And you know, we're one Earth. We need to do this together. So, um, I ask you to please reconsider these restrictive decibel levels and set reasonable levels to allow the thoughtful and necessary development of wind power.
I'm uh, Jack Windis. I'm a resident of Wilmington. I moved here uh, in retirement a couple years ago. Um, came from Iowa. Iowa has been mentioned here earlier this evening, and uh, Iowa has many wind farms that uh, I have seen. And uh, in terms of uh, almost 30 years in Iowa, there's almost nothing uh, unfavorable, I must say, that I heard about the, the wind turbines at the time. It's a very desirable thing the farmers have them out in their field, and uh, it's a real plus. Um, I've been coming to uh, Vermont. Uh, both my parents were born here, and they're buried here, same town I'm in right now. And uh, a few years ago, um, as I looked out on uh, Searsburg uh, and the, the scope of the uh, uh, of the mountains changed with the wind turbines, um, I wondered, you know, how many people thought how ugly that was and how uh, unattractive it was. And I guess tonight I'm surprised that so few people have mentioned that, um, and uh, I must say that through the years uh, I've grown to uh, accept that, and I think it's just part of where we are in our modern world today. Um, so I, I'm one that uh, certainly is in favor of uh, a reasonable thought on this, and uh, in particular in wind. I think if we're the, the Green Mountain State, it certainly in my mind is one of those items that uh, that fits in there. I think we've heard uh, from many people tonight about uh, the environment and the f effect that it's had on it. Um, and so the one thoughts uh, that I've not heard about tonight, um, and I thought for a while we were going there with World War II and the machine guns, but uh, that was not it. But if you think of some of the wars that we've had in recent times in the United <coughs> States just in the last few years in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and you think of some of the uh, reasons that we have gone to war uh, and the effect that that's having and what's uh, happened with the unsettling situation in the Middle East. Um, these are all problems that have come to Vermont and the United States uh, with uh, refugee problems and the things that I believe that uh, uh, the fossil fuel uh, industry uh, and going down that road have, uh, have got us into. So, that would be uh, an additional thought that I think that uh, should go into the thinking on this. Um, there's certainly been other places than, uh, than Iowa, other parts of the world where this has been investigated uh, from a decibel standpoint and health issues, and I think that uh, there is evidence out there, and I think we should be listening uh, to the evidence. We should also be listening uh, to individuals in the public, but I think uh, this can be done in a very reasonable way, and I think, uh, as others have said, I think we need to move forward with, uh, with wind power with all due speed and to, uh, in fact, hasten the process, but while doing so, taking into consideration of uh, individuals in the public and, uh, and uh, other things that will help, in my mind, maintain Vermont as the Green Mountain State uh, in perpetuity. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, yes, we'd like to speak again. Unless there's someone who has not spoken, and we'd like to speak again, they'll go first. Thank you. state of Vermont needs to become involved. However, in my tenure here in Vermont, I have taken the time to visit every single major wind facility and find out for myself what the problems were. I served for a while politically in Grafton, and we were under uh, a very heavy issue concerning wind. And I thought I needed to know what it was that other people were dealing with. So I have gone to Georgia Mountain, I have gone to Lowell, I have gone to Albany, I've gone to Sheffield, I've gone to Hoosick Falls, New York. I can tell you personally, there are serious issues in those towns. Now, I heard tonight that somebody drove through Lowell, and it was fine, and I drove through Lowell, and it was fine. 
Low is on the upside of the wind. When you look at that ridge, the wind comes across the ridge. Low is getting $485,000 worth of tax benefit, and they're not getting any of the deleterious effects. However, if you cross that ridge and go into Albany, they are getting a gratis $10,000 a year, and they're getting hammered. And there are people there who are suffering. When you go to Georgia Mountain, even though there are only four turbines, there are people there who are suffering. I have sat on people's front porches, and I have felt the vibration on the wall of their homes. I have stood in Albany on a farm that was bought by Green Mountain Power because the people couldn't live there. And I began to realize that I had a cardiac rhythm that was going on that was not mine. It was a different vibration. It was very, very unsettling, and I needed to leave. I began to wonder what's going on. It's not about the decibels of that fan. It's not about a car going by. It's not about a train that comes by at midnight every night. It's about the fact that you have this pulsation. It's a boom, 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 and it goes on and on and on. And it begins to wear you down. It is very, very unhealthy. I agree, we need wind. We need solar. We need to get busy. We need to do it right in Vermont. But I tell you, that size scale wind in this state on ridge lines is not Somerset County. I'm from Pennsylvania. I, I know the people whose farm were like 93 went down. I've been there. I've seen that. I've lived in California. I know what smog is because of the mountains. Those are different problems. I've heard a lot of people tonight bring all these different things in and try to compare them to our situation here in Vermont. I implore you that when you look at what's going on, you discount what's going on in California, you discount what's going on in West Texas. You look at what's going on in Vermont. That's the data that you drive your decision. I believe 35 is correct. I believe small-scale wind is excellent. There was a lady who talked earlier about the small-scale renewable project in Vermont. That's where we need to go. I'm going to work on drafting on getting an assessment of what our energy uses plans are so that we can do this on a small local scale. We need citizens involved. We do not need mega corporations putting 500 foot tall turbines in our small villages and disrupting the culture and the life of people in Vermont. It's not an appropriate step. I'll give you a couple examples. In Saxons River, there's a, there's a couple homeowners who got together and they did a small solar facility and they're powering a number of homes in a section of town. Everybody's very happy with that. The town of Cavendish has done the same thing. They're powering all the municipal buildings. They're doing it on a small scale. It can be done. But you cannot have large industrial wind facilities in small ridgeline villages where the wind bounces off the ridgelines and disrupts the way people live here in Vermont. Yes, we need to get green. Yes, we need renewable energy. But, as someone said earlier, what about those poor people in West Virginia? We do not want to do to the people of Vermont what West Virginia did to the people of West Virginia just through a different industry. We need to keep it small, we need to keep it local, we need to have it broad-based, and we need it at 35 decibels. Thank you.
Vermont has one of the least carbon footprints in the state of this country. It's important that people do their homework, as I did, to get to where I am today makes me realise that, yes, we need to take another direction, but at what cost to the state of Vermont, and to what cost for going forward in our energy production. I think it's important, and I believe that 35 decibel is a great place that we should be at. I've stood in wind farms, and I can tell you, you don't get the feeling when you stand under a 500 foot tower of the noise or what we consider to be infrasound. You have to move away to feel. And this is what this is about right now. We're talking about the sound. The sound is important. I implore all of you to do your research on the sound. As more and more wind farms come online, the health effects of turbines are becoming a health issue. Thank you very much.